Welcome to the Psychedelia Podcast, where we talk about the third wave of psychedelics. Through our many wide-ranging conversations with scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and event organizers, we bring you an exclusive look into the many minds of the psychedelic world. It's time to let the word out about psychedelics and how they can be used as tools to benefit both the individual and the community. Welcome to the third wave. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast for all of you new listeners. My name is Paul Austin. I'm the host of the Third Wave Podcast. And for those of you who are returning, welcome back. Today, we have a, another excellent podcast for you. And this one is with a New York Times bestseller and award-winning journalist um, who I'll get into in a little bit. His name is Stephen Kotler. And we had a pretty lengthy conversation this time around, about an hour and a half but all really good stuff that we went through in the podcast. So to start with, per usual, this week in psychedelics, just to keep everyone up to date on some things that have been going on in the psychedelic space, you can consider this your weekly digest to get everything that you need. First, let's start off. Maps have added new cryptocurrencies, Ethereum and Litecoin to its donation currencies in addition to Bitcoin, which will help to expand the opportunities for cryptocurrency philanthropy. So I've actually, on a personal note, have been getting into cryptocurrency over the past couple of weeks. It really will redefine how we as a society and culture interact with money. I read this collection of essays and talks called The Internet of Money, which is an excellent starter resource for anyone who wants to learn more about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. In fact, about nine months ago, I bought some Bitcoin for the usual purpose of anyone who's interested in in psychedelics. And I then didn't use it for whatever reason. And I had about $300 worth of Bitcoin. And this was back in September, I believe. And then for whatever reason, I checked it again in May or June. And all of a sudden, I had $1,300 in Bitcoin because it's gone up uh, so much. So On accident, I made about $1,000 from an accidental investment in Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency is really fascinating. I think it's going to completely transform the financial system that we currently live in. And I'm excited to see what happens with it. So it's really cool that MAPS is doing this. And in fact, they're celebrating this with an August 13 cruise on the San Francisco Bay to benefit MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD research. So this podcast will be released on August 12th. So the following day, August 13th, there will be this cruise. So check it out if you feel like doing so. Second bit of news, Stephen Bright, who we actually interviewed on the podcast when we launched our podcast initially. So I interviewed him in November 2016. He is the head of a psychedelic research organization called PRISM, which is based in Australia, recently spoke at TEDx Melbourne about the psychedelic renaissance. You can listen to that podcast interview with Stephen to get a more in-depth feel for the state of psychedelic research. Last bit of news, a friend of mine, Leah, Leah, I want to say Leah Friedman, is putting on an event in Boston called A Trip to the Past, Boston's Psychedelic History. It's the first big event that the Boston Entheogenic Network has organized. Don Latin, again, one of our previous guests, will be there, and Basically, it's September 15th through 17th, 2017. It's also supporting MAPS research. There will be a psychedelic story hour, book talks, a walking tour, and a speaker panel. And I'll quickly read the description for you. Retrace the steps of the Harvard Psychedelic Club with author Don Latin at Harvard University, Boston University, and other landmarks in the Boston area. Learn more about the stories behind Timothy Leary, Ram Das, Houston Smith, Andrew Weil, Walter Ponky, and more. This is brought to you by Boston Entheogenic Network in collaboration with the Northeastern University Students for Sensible Drug Policy and the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. It will be a three-day community gathering and feature a small series of events across greater Boston. So we'll provide a link to that in the show notes, A Trip to the Past, Boston Psychedelic History, September 15th through 17th, 2017. One last note. There was an article just published in the Financial Times in which I was briefly quoted. Hold on, I'm going to pull it up on my computer that talks about kind of the resurgence of microdosing in Silicon Valley. And the name of the article is How Silicon Valley Rediscovered LSD. It's an extensive article. James Fadiman is, of course, featured in it. Molly Malouf, who I had a recent conversation with and who we're hoping to bring on the podcast as well. She's a doctor who does personalized medicine with Silicon Valley executives, some of whom integrate microdosing LSD into their uh, daily routine. 
So I'd recommend checking out that article as well. It's a, it's a well-written article, uh, super extensive, tracing the history of LSD up to its current times and how that has informed and influenced what's been going on in the tech world in Silicon Valley. That's it for this week in psychedelics. More about our guest, Stephen Kotler. I first heard of Stephen on the Unmistakable Creative podcast about three years ago and is really interested in the work that he's doing with the Flow Genome Project. So Stephen is a New York Times bestselling author. He's an award-winning journalist, and he's the co-founder and director of research for the Flow Genome Project. Basically, he's one of the world's leading experts on ultimate human performance. And in his most recent book, Stealing Fire, he talks a lot about psychedelics and particularly microdosing, Burning Man as well. So I had to bring him on the podcast to just get a bit more insight into his own psychedelic experiences, which we get into in the very beginning, both with MDMA and a few other things, as well as his thoughts about why psychedelics will be critical tools and critical technologies going forward to initiate flow states and help us to solve complex problems in the world that we're living in. So this is a far-ranging conversation. It goes about 70 to 80 minutes, a little bit longer than usual. However, I think Stephen is probably one of the best guests that we've had on in terms of his, not only his credentials, but just his breadth of knowledge. So I highly recommend listening to the whole thing. If you do enjoy the podcast, we ask you to please, please, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you're so inclined, maybe a small donation on Patreon as well. Patreon.com backslash the third wave. That helps to support this podcast so that we can continue to invest in making it better and higher quality for you listeners. And I think more importantly, so we can continue to expand the message of the utility of psychedelics and the importance of destigmatizing them, re-legitimizing them, and reintegrating them into our global culture and society. So without further ado, I bring you Stephen Kotler. Tell me about that first MDMA experience. What was it like? So... You have to understand that I grew up a punk rocker we're in, in like radical subculture. And a lot of the people around me did a lot of drugs. They were in and out of jail. It was a, it was, it was a heavy scene. People died. There, were, there was costs. And so my job often was to talk to the cops. I was the guy. And I originally ended up with the job because most substances don't affect me very strongly. The technical term, right, inside the psychedelic community is they call me a hardhead. And this is anything, right? Like when I go to the doctor and like have surgery, I have to tell them that opiates won't work as well on me. Like it's every, it's any substance, right? It's any any mind altering substance. So in the beginning, by the end of it, like I was the guy who stayed sober and I was sober almost completely until I was like 21, 22. It really like I had smoked some pot, but like really hadn't done many substances and this was early 90s and I was in college and a friend of mine, like MDMA was showing up and, you know, we heard about him. So some friends of mine had decided they were going to take a semester off of college and to fund their semester off of college, they bought a pound of MDMA from some cooks up in Oregon at Reed College and they get it. That by you, like nobody, it's eight cents a hit that. Point. Like that's what they paid for it, right? Nobody's really seen this drug. They don't know how to pack it. They buy gel caps, like they're trying to pack, you know, hits into capsules. It was the only time in my life because I came down off that drug, and this was actually a very pivotal moment. It led to a very pivotal moment, and that ultimately led to a lot of my work with stealing fire and things like that. And I'll walk you through the story, which was when I came down. So emotionally, I had. I was just closed off. I'd always been really closed off and love was not something I really understood, felt, whatever. So this was really the first time in my life I'd ever really felt pure love. Like, right. That was my experience. And when I came down, it was the worst experience of my life because I fit my choices as far as I could tell was I either become a drug addict and spend my life on MDMA or I'm going to kill myself if I don't feel that way. Like that was where I was when I was coming down. That was a difficult emotion. It took a lot of months and years. And one of the more interesting experiences of my life was a couple years after that, four or five years after that, I was, I don't know how to tell this story, not 
polite, clean way. So Don't. let's just say I was in bed with a woman who I had been really attracted to for a lot of years. Like I had a crush for years and years and years. And finally, we get together, we're in bed, and I get up to go to the bathroom. I'm taking a piss. And while I'm pissing, I feel all the MDMA drop out of me, the drop, right, that you get. And I'm like, oh, crap, the drug's going away. And then I stopped and went, wait a minute, I am totally sober. I haven't smoked anything, drank anything, taken a drug. This is the exact same feeling I had that first time when I nearly overdosed on this stuff. And it's the same feeling, completely using endogenous neurochemistry, nothing external. And it was, this was really, I mean, I was in my early 20s. It was, you know, long before I'd started researching flow at any, any depth or anything else like that. Very early on, I realized that anything you could produce pharmacologically, externally, you could produce endogenously. And who knows if that's 100% accurate at, at this point, right? But at that point, that was the realization I had. And, and it blew my mind, right? And it was, it's essentially the central thesis underneath Stealing Fire, that all these various things, whether it's sex or drugs or meditation or flow states or whatever – neurobiologically, they're the same experience. And that was the first time I actually got the experience of that. For me, that was the seed kernel of the idea that, you know, 25 years later became Steel and Fire. That's really cool. So I have a couple follow-up questions. One, what you're describing sounds a lot like me in terms of when I was 19, I did LSD for the first time. Before that point, again, I, I live in my head a lot, very thinking-oriented, I'm always kind of coming up with new systems, new ideas. And that first experience that I had at LSD was this complete unraveling and opening of all of my emotions where I finally just felt totally connected and loved and accepted and understood. And it was like this beautiful thing. And then from that experience, that was so profound and insightful and what put me on this kind of like, you know, what people would call like a personal development kick where I was like, okay, I understand that this feeling side of me is underdeveloped. Um, I understand that like for that reason, I may be missing out on certain things or whatever it might be. And I wanted to do things to help overcome that. So that's when I got into meditation. That's when I got into understanding reading. That's when I got into traveling a lot. A lot. So all these different experiential things that seemed to help me put kind of get back into that, that state yeah. of mind. What was that like for you? You know, you had that first MDMA experience and then, you know, you had this realization a few years later. Was there a, a growth process for you in between that led up to that point? Or, yeah, what was that growth so, process like? You know, I've talked about this a couple of times on a couple other podcasts, but mm -hmm. so one of the reasons I was completely sober for that three year period is, as I said, really crazy punk rock crowd. A lot of people got sober, right? Along the way, a lot of people, NAA, and I got dragged to an open AA meet, right? Early on, right? I was maybe 18, 19. And I wasn't, I like at that point, honest to God, maybe I've been drunk four or five times and smoked pot like four or five times, like total, but I had no emotional control, none, right? Hadn't really felt much love, but boy, did I feel everything else and I couldn't control it. Rage, and, you know, all that, everything you could possibly feel that way. And when I got to AA, I went, wow, I can learn emotional control here. Like, so I spent three years going to AA meetings, staying sober, not because I really, it was a, a drug or alcohol thing, but because I knew I, if I was going to live, like if I was going to make it out of my twenties, I had to learn that emotional control. And I think what happened with MDMA, like I was, I think from AA and from that period, I learned to control most of my negative emotions. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole other side to that coin, which is, and you know, we talk about this a little bit in stealing fire. And it's certainly, and I talk about it in uh, Rise of Superman as well, there's a whole spectrum, the ecstatic spectrum. These are very positive emotions, and you need to know how to navigate those just as well, right? A lot of people hear people talk about learning to control your emotions and, you know, and hold on to it. It's not just the negative ones, right? If the positive ones are just as, just as dicey on a certain level, and I had to, you know, it's been a, it's been a really long time to kind of get, I'm still, I, you know, if you, if you talk to... If you talk to friends of mine, they'll tell you I'm still not good at love. I've got a business partner, one of my business partners in something. Every He's British, and every time we get off the phone, what is it about the Europe where they're so emotionally closed until they're not, and then they gush all over you, right? I don't understand that, but whatever. He always, at the end of every call, he's like, well, I love you, man. And I'm like, man, don't say that to me because I'm going to come back with fuck you. 
You know what I mean? I got nothing to say to you. So I have to warn you. My wife and I run an animal sanctuary. Okay. I'm talking to you with one, uh, like 17 dogs behind me. There's, I think, like eight chihuahuas in here with me and a miniature poodle. I was reading about this on your, I was looking through your personal website a little bit. And I think there's a little blurb on there about you, about how you've been running the, the rescue for some time. Yeah, we, my wife and I have been doing it for about 10 years. What got you into that then? What got you into the, the rescue thing with the chihuahuas? So I've always been an animal geek. Always. And as a journalist, when I was starting out, I would go, one of the things you discover as a journalist is I wanted to write it at some point I may, I wanted to write a biography of my time as a freelance journalist and call it scam. And now mind you, it's a different world now, but back. Are you the scammer or or are you getting scammed? What, What I figured out is that with six months runway, I could pretty much go anywhere in the world and do anything I wanted to. It took a lot of work to set up. Massive amounts of work. But if I wanted to go to Madagascar to study with like MacArthur Genius Award winning primatologists for months on end and get the entire trip paid for and blow, I like I could figure it out. You had to line up five or six articles. It took a while. And it was, you know, there was a lot of stuff to do, but you could do it. And so what started to happen is I started to realize that I was going extraordinarily far out of my way to spend time with scientists who were spending time with animals over and over and over again. I would work for years to go spend a week somewhere in Africa watching some species or other and over and over. Simultaneously, I always believed that a part of your life should be service. And I don't believe this for, there's no broad metaphysics underneath this. I honestly think I'm an artist and left to your own devices as an artist, you will end up being a selfish asshole. Hmm. That is right. Cause you spend all your time in your head, focused on your work, all about you. And then when I come out in the world, right, I publish a book, I come out in the world. What happens for three months? People just ask me questions about me, right? It's really easy to become a crazy narcissist along the way. And I realized that like one of the ways to defend against that was to make altruism a fundamental part of my life. It had to be woven through my life in such a way that it was always there because it was the only way I could protect against the assholeness that comes with being a writer, I think. That was for me, just my personality. And so at the time, I had spent seven years creating a, something called the Reporter's Gym. It was with the LA Lakers, it was Dave, with Dave Eggers after school tutoring organization. And we were teaching inner city kids how to be sports writers as a kind of a way out of the ghetto, right? And it was a really cool program. It was awesome. We'd ran it for a couple of years, really had a great impact. And the problem was I just sucked. I sucked with the kids. I didn't know how to teach teenagers. I'm either a teenager myself or I'm a jerk, apparently. Like there's no middle setting. And on top of it, my heart wasn't in it. I like I was doing the work because I thought I should do the work. My heart wasn't in it. Same time this was going on, I met my wife who was doing dog rescue, which was all the stuff. I, like I was going to hang out in Africa, be, people who were doing primate rescue, essentially. Like you call it a lot of other things, right? And conservation biology and rainforest. But it was just primate rescue. And I met a woman who was doing dog rescue. And it suddenly dawned on me. I was like, wait a minute. Like this desire to be around animals all the time. I can couple it with my, you know, desire for altruism. I also realized that dog rescue, the way, especially the way we do it, it's in our house. Like it's in my face all the time, right? There's, as I said, 12 or 13 dogs around me right now, or 14 dogs, whatever it is. So that level of kind of selflessness that's required to take care of, we do uh, hospice care and special needs care. So we work with very old and very sick animals. That requires a lot of focus outside myself, and it's in my face all the time, which I think is important, for me at least, because it balances what kind of creativity does to you in terms of being so focused. And especially when I'm down the rabbit hole of a book, I can go weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks without talking to anybody, maybe my wife, but like it's my focus is that I'll write 11, 12 hours a day, come up, watch a movie, go to bed, do it again, and for months on end that kind of stuff. That's really a lot of focus on yourself and your head. And you know what I mean? So it's, I find it's very useful to guard against myself in active ways <laughs> and just be passive about it. Right. That's just me. Some of it is I've loved animals. I'm crazy about animals. I've worked on an environmental 
issues forever. You know, in three weeks in, in Squaw Valley, I'm launching with a huge team, a conference concert and innovation accelerator called Creating Equilibrium that is aimed at kind of bridging the gap between technologists and environmentalists to solve environmental challenges like biodiversity. And biodiversity is where we're focusing our attention this first year. So fighting for the environment has really been important. Everybody has their goals. And, you know, one of mine is when I'm done, I want to make this world a better place for animals. That's you know, something I do every day I wake up and I'm like, all right, how do I improve the relationship between humans and animals? How do I make it better for animals here? That's a fu- That's one of the three things I focus on every day. This kind of like this, I want to dig into this a little bit more, but kind of the, the tail end of this conversation reminds me of this book, Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. But it's so funny. I have that on my uh, to read list. It's yeah. sitting, like, sitting behind me. I haven't read it yet. I well, know the book. It talks about that relationship, right? So when we as humans, we cultivate these, we don't perceive ourselves as being like above, but rather we perceive ourselves as being part of a larger ecosystem. And uh-huh. that's when this, this mindset of cultivation and taking care really comes to the forefront rather than what you're talking about, this more kind of aggressive, uh, growth dominated oriented mindset that's really dictated industrialization and nation state building for the past 500 years. So that you know, even this personal transformation, not transformation, but these personal boundaries that you've set up for yourself where you're weaving in altruism that also seems to be indicative of some things you talk about in Stealing Fire, which is like a lot of leaders in today's world, right? We're starting to relearn the importance of altruism because of things like, for example, accountability in the internet. So we had this major issue recently with Uber, where because they had such an aggressive kind of misogynist culture, (laughs) they're CEO ended up having to step down. There are a number of people on their advisory board who had who had to step down. And I think it's because a lot of people in these tech circles, like you're talking about, they kind of get stuck in their own bubble. So I, I was curious if these own experiences that you've had with becoming more altruistic, weaving it in, is this something that you talk about in your more public conversations when you're doing consulting or work with, you know, corporations or organizations or anything like that? Depends when I'm there. First of all, the answer is really depends how long I'm there. I do talk about this stuff occasionally. I, this is None of this is hidden. You know what I mean? I, like a lot of it's in Small Furry Prayer, which is my book about the relationship between humans and animals and, and the work we do here as well. The average corporation, for example, who brings in the Flow Genome Project brings us in for a day or two. And we're there to train them up in flow. And that's what we're focusing on. And there, you know, there's a lot of emotional components in high performance, right? We talked earlier a little bit. There's a fundamental level of emotional control required, right? We talk about that at the end of stealing fire. This is not, you know, if you come to the Flow Genome Project, anybody can take one of our entrance level courses. But if you want to take one of our advanced courses, you're going to get a letter in the mail that says, hey, thank you so much for your interest in this course. Know that if you've got emotional issues that are unresolved, don't take this course. We're going to make you worse. It's going to mess you up. Don't do it. Go work with whoever you need to work with to get through this stuff, then come back. And that's very, it's very true. High performance, there's a cliche saying that I like to hear, which is, you know, if you hit a tree moving 10 miles an hour, you dent a fender. You hit a tree at 100 miles an hour, you crash up the car, right? When you're working with high performance, it's the same thing, right? When you start getting a lot of flow going in your life, everything accelerates, everything. Your thoughts accelerate, everything that happens in your life really starts to pick up speed. You're pulling a lot of energy in a, you know, stupid metaphysical sense of the term, I guess. And you have to be careful. You have to have some emotional control. There's no way around it. Same thing if you're you're interested in psychedelics, if you're interested in, you know, these meditation is a softer path there, but psychedelics, you know, we were talking about MDMA, that's a sticky substance. You come down from doing MDMA for the first time, you want to do more MDMA, right? The first thing you confront is the fact that this is sticky, and if you don't have some self-control, you're going to have some addiction problems one way or another. There's just no way around it. You have to have the control and the responsibility and the proper structures in your life to really run these experiments successfully over time because these are powerful substances. They're fundamental motivators in the brain. Right? This is the very stuff that evolution designed to drive us through our lives, and you're playing with it at extremely intense concentrations. right? And then it's producing all kinds of crazy effects. Oneness with everything. Remember the first time you felt one with everything? 
when you're done feeling one with everything, you wanted to feel that way again. Too. Yes. So that's why I did LSD like 12 times in the first six months, you know? Yeah. Nobody talks about it, but like the God drug, right, for lack of a better term here, it's sticky too. People who get into it through meditation too, you see it. There's a reason people are willing to spend five, six, seven hours a day sitting in the full lotus position. It's not because sitting cross-legged on the floor is so fun. It's really not what's going on. It's the neurochemistry you can trigger, and it's powerful. It's sticky. It's sticky then too, but when you really concentrate it in a psychedelic form or you know, in some of the technology that's coming where it's instant on, instant off, we need fortitude. We need control. We need a lot of responsibility. This is not for everyone. And you know, talking about this reminds me of microdosing, right? Because microdosing is one of those things that it seems to be this trajectory of like day zero to day 90. So these high doses, right? The sense of having a <coughs> mystical experience, connection, oneness, you have that experience, you come down from it, they can be sticky, right? But it also can be difficult to integrate. And this insight that you just were talking about how 10 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour this just got me thinking a lot about microdosing because a lot of people are getting into microdosing and microdosing seems to be like meditation on steroids where basically you're taking low doses of LSD a couple times a week. I did it for seven months. I still do it once or twice a week. And what I noticed is because I had done a lot of work before I started a microdosing regimen, this was maybe three to four years of personal development work. When I started microdosing, it accelerated everything and it ended up working out really well. But I've talked to other people and it doesn't work out so well. And I think it's because of the exact reason that you're talking about is that infrastructure isn't built yet. And so if they try to accelerate things through this process of microdosing, then they just accelerate this process of destruction a bit faster. And if they don't have a container for it, a context, then it can end in disaster. So we do some work with the U.S. Special Forces, the Navy SEALs. One of the things that is at the absolute core of SEAL training is in a crisis situation of any kind, you revert to your base level training. And to put this in just kind of simpler terms, the more fear in the system, the less options you have. The extreme example is fight or flight, right? You only have three options. You can fight, you can flee, or you can freeze. And that's, that's neurobiological. Norepinephrine, which kind of governs fear, limits the options the brain has, limits the choices, which is why, for example, when people do Ritalin or crystal meth or those kinds of speed drugs, which are norepinephrine drugs, they're really great at doing repetitive tasks, the same thing over and over and over again, but really broad, far-reaching creative insights, those don't show up. And they don't show up because that's norepinephrine doesn't allow a lot of them. So if you haven't sort of done the work, when fear gets in the system, it's going to start limiting your choices. You're going to go back to your training right? Whatever your training is. When we're talking about this kind of work, it's your emotional training because that's what you're messing around with a little bit. And the other thing is you can't, you know, the funny thing about personal development is, as you know, I hate that term, but we'll, <laughs> Me too. We'll yeah. the funny thing about it is like, you can do all the work in the world, go to seminars, learn to med, blah, until like it works when you're in a fight with your wife or your girlfriend, right? You haven't learned it until you are in a crisis situation. And instead of reverting back to asshole version 101, you're now at asshole version 201, which is slightly better, right? Then you know you've done the work. Then you know maybe it's time. You know what I mean? That's one of the ways you can test it is how do you do in your own life stone cold sober in crisis situations? If you're still losing your shit in crisis situations, you probably shouldn't be playing too much with these technologies. You should probably be doing some basic work first. So what is that basic work? Like if you go in somewhere, and you need to build that up first, what basic work do you do? I don't know what that work is. Honestly. <laughs> I mean, I like, you know, some of it, I mean, okay, so let, let me, I, I take that back. At least you're honest, right? <laughs> I don't know. No. I mean, some of it is, what you need is a little bit of space from your thoughts, right? One of the great things that meditation gives you is you that gap, right? So you're not quite as reactive. The thought arises, you have a second to look at it before it attaches to emotion. Because once that thought becomes emotion, once you look at that thing and go, oh my God, that's a freaking threat, you've lost control. By that point, all the neurochemistry has rushed in. You've changed your physiology. There's no, you can't go backwards. And the, and the great example of this is, so one of the things that I train people in is reframing. 
cognitive reframing. So one of the things this research was just done at Harvard, if you're feeling anxious, the old suggestion is get a control of your breath. Breathe in really slowly, long exhales, that sort of thing. It'll calm your nervous system down. And it will, but it's a slow intervention. It's going to take three to 10 minutes. It's much easier to look at that anxiety and reframe it. And literally, if you look at that anxiety, feel it, and you say to yourself, this is excitement, this is excitement, this is excitement, it's easier to turn anxiety into excitement. They're the same signal. They're both norepinephrine. So there's no difference. Neurobiologically, it's the same signal. The only thing different is the frame we build around it. Either be anxiety or excitement. In fact, when you get out of, when you start going into lower mammals, like down around cows, for example, cows can only feel anxiety and curiosity. It's an either or. They switch back and forth. This is Temple Grandin's work, if you ever want to look at it. Temple Grandin did this work. They switch back and forth. They can't feel both at once. Humans can sort of feel both at once, but again, it's kind of a binary. So if you can reframe anxiety as excitement, if you can get into that gap, thought arises, right? And before it becomes emotion, you can build the frame around it. You can calm it down. You don't have to do all this stuff on the back end. So I think part of it is some kind of breath work meditation practice, mindfulness practice. Box breathing is what I like, which I always think is, you know, meditation for dummies, but it will give you, you know, space to do that. And some of it is just, I think also a daily gratitude work, kind of the positive psychology basics, which is mindfulness and a, and a daily gratitude practice. Those things are very, very useful. The gratitude practices will train your brain to look for positive information instead of negative information and is wired to look for negative. Right? We're built that way. That's how our danger detectors work. That's how our filters work. So you can tilt it with a daily gratitude practice. It gives you access to all kinds of different information, fundamental for creativity. Right, Really important to get that new information as kind of a baseline for creativity. So it matters in high performance, but it also matters in emotional control. I think those two things are really rock bottom basics. And then you just got to take a deep look at your life and then sort of like, fight your way up that ridiculous boss mountain. You know what I mean? I'm a big Rilke fan. I, you know, Rilke said live the questions and it's kind of a cliche, but honest to God, I think that's the best way. For me, that's been the best way forward. Live the questions. Yeah, live the questions. What are your questions? I've always said all this work that I've done with, with flow, with, with all these kind of mind altering technologies, you know, one of my fundamental questions has always been, where does the information come from? When you're in these states, everybody has the same experience, right? Some of it, I can be in the, I look, I understand the neurobiology as maybe as well as anybody on the planet right now. Mm -hmm. And I can look at some of it and go, okay, I could, I understand how norepinephrine and dopamine are tuning signal to noise ratios. And I'm seeing more patterns and more connections. And I'm thinking fast. like I get all the actual physics, but there are, are occasionally bits of information that come through where you go, where the hell did that come from? How did I know that? And let me give you a classic example. The example I always give people on this is one of the more profound flow states I ever had took place in Santa Monica. I was surfing and I was at Topanga, I believe. So just up from Santa Monica and Topanga Canyon. It's a very fast wave and it was a pretty big day. I took off late and the wave jacked up and I realized that it had sort of sucked back off the reef and it was closing out on me. And I dropped into an immediate flow state and I linked together like six moves. Off of cut back into a floater, into blah, blah, blah. That I had, here's the thing. I was an intermediate surfer. I had never done any of those moves before, right? At all, let alone six in a row. So you can say, okay, Stephen, well, you were in flow. We know your muscle reaction times were way amped up. We know that pattern recognition was going full bore and all that stuff. All that stuff is great. That explains the physicality of it, but there's still information. An off-the-lip cutback requires me to move my body in a very specific direction at a very specific time and then change that direction, right? That's information. That's data. That wasn't anything I knew how to do. So you can say, okay, well, maybe you've seen enough videos of off-the-lip cutbacks that you have mirror neurons, you internalized it, and it was reaching into the surf movie database. Okay, fine, I see that. And I, maybe I see that for one or two moves, but I did about six moves in a row that I'd never done before, I'd never seen comboed in that way. Like, it stretches the limits of my credibility. I was not a particularly good surfer. So I look at that and I go, well, I don't know. Where did that information come from? Is it metaphysical? Is it coming from some place outside myself? I have no idea. 
It didn't feel internal to me. It felt greater than the sum of my knowledge at that point. And where did that information come from? That's not an unusual experience in a flow state, in a psychedelic experience, in certain kind of meditative states. Right? That's a very common experience. I tend to be a hardcore rational materialist. I tend to think there's scientific explanations and that we don't have to reach into the metaphysics. But there's a long line going all the way back to, you know, Carl Jung's collective unconscious and to your heart. Cardan and the noosphere, like a lot of people have been poking at this, right? It's a, a lot of people have been trying to live this question. To me, one of the easiest ways to live that question is to spend as much time as I possibly can in flow exploring these states and trying to probe that. That's one way to live that question. Another way to live that question is to do what I've done. We just started a giant neurobiology research company so we could investigate it further. Let's talk a little bit about that because that's one thing that I wanted to dig into a little bit more with you was, you know, the Flow Genome Project. I, I read the brief description and watched the brief, you know, six minute video that you have on your site. You guys are basically trying to map flow states. Love to hear a little bit more about that. How do you map flow states and what way does that occur? What are you guys doing at the Flow Genome Project? So great questions. So when we originally started out the Flow Genome Project, the goal was to really help put flow states on a hard science footing. And at the time it was really necessary. The new flow had sort of 2000s, a woman named Hudak Kill who is one of the world's leading experts on endorphins. She's at the University of Michigan, and she was the president of the American Society for Neuroscience. And she told Gina Collada of the New York Times that endorphins in the brain producing flow states is a total fantasy of the pop culture. So it was total crap. Now, as it turns out, she was wrong. We didn't figure that out until 2007, 2008, until our imaging technology got to the point that we could actually see endorphins in the brain. And this work was done in Germany, it was done again in Italy, it's been done all over now. But at the time, once she said it, flow research ground to a halt in America, basically. It just, you couldn't get funding for it anymore because she was so well known that just it killed it. And the new age at the same time, they love the term flow. It was very, you know, in line with a lot of things the new age community had been thinking. You know, millennials really adopted a lot of new age language, took it out of the new age and sort of made it very mainstream. But all of that made scientists hugely uncomfortable. And so research in America pretty much had dried up. And I got a chance to sit down with uh, one of the guys who ran kind of the neuroscience wing of the National Science Foundation and briefed him on what we wanted to do in terms of flow research, and he just started laughing in my face. So I realized that doing this inside of academia was going to be incredibly difficult. At the same time, my friend Andrew Hessel, who's a synthetic biologist, sat me down, and he knew what I'd been trying to do. And for years, I've been trying to get scientists to start a research program inside of academia for this. He sat me down and said, look, man, you can't do this inside of academia. He runs, among other things, the world's first nonprofit cancer research foundation, and he couldn't do what he wanted inside of academia. So he like he had firsthand knowledge and he said, look, you've got to do this outside of academia. And if you do, I'll join your board, I'll back you. And I ended up broaching that idea with a bunch of other neuroscientists I knew. And they all said the same thing. If you do this, we'll back you. We can't do this in academia, but you know as much as anybody we know about this topic. And yeah, let's do this. So that's sort of where my, Jamie had been doing a whole bunch of other stuff on his side of the Flow Genome Project. That was sort of my backstory with it and where it came from. And the early goal was to kind of just take the terminology, stabilize the language, establish a common language around this stuff and take it away from the new age and just show people how much research had actually been done. The other problem was scientists were balkanized. So the EEG guys didn't know what the neurochemistry guys were doing, didn't know what the psychologists were doing. And it got, you know, I was on the phone with one of the world's leading flow psychologists and I had to explain the neurochemistry of flow to her. The last time she had paid attention was the 70s. And it was like, this was the early 2000s, right? It was that balkanized. So we had to find a way to bridge those gaps. Rise of Superman was that goal, right? We established the common language. We put all the research in one place at one time. And what was so spectacular about the end results is once that was done, flow research very quickly ended up on a hard science footing. That happened very, very quickly. I was shocked. You know, I thought it was going to be a little tiny piece that we were putting forward in a huge puzzle, but it was sort of like there were so many people who were waiting for validation that it just suddenly flow research exploded. And some of it had to do with the fact that she sent me high and Martin Seligman had been pounding at this stuff for so long and doing such a fantastic job. And I came along and got to popularize some of it. It just, the timing was right. 
Anyways, you asked what we do at the Flow Genome Project, and we do three things. We're a research and a training organization. On the research side, um, I think we're the world's largest open source research project into ultimate human performance. And if you're dealing with really squishy topics like flow, one of the best ways to approach them is a big data approach. So we have a huge community. Flow Hacker Nation is 80,000 people strong. So if we put out a flow survey, if they get 500 answers to a survey in a typical you know, science study, that's robust. Chicksetmihai's High's original flow study was the largest psychological survey anybody had ever done. I think 22 to 25,000 respondents globally in the end, right? But it took like 15 years to do it. Our flow profile, which said it's a tradeology. It says if you're this kind of person, you're likely to find flow in this, these directions, which anybody can take for free on the Flow Genome Project website has become the largest study ever done in optimal performance. Some 70,000 people have taken that survey because the internet crowdsourcing this stuff allows us to go big really fast. So we're working on our very first kind of flow and creativity studies and a deeper flow trigger study right now. We'll be launching them to the fall along with um, one of the very first, I think it's the very first comparative study ever done between flow and psychedelics. And we're teaming up with some researchers in Imperial College, David Nutt's group in London, and who have been doing a lot of the great imaging work with psychedelics. And we're going to do the first comparative study. And you asked earlier about what questions are interesting. Side by side, you know, comparative studies between altered states of consciousness are really neat. And we're just seeing the first of it. Like a couple months ago, somebody compared Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques against Zen techniques, I think, using MRI and EEG. That stuff hasn't been done. And we're getting to the point that we can start doing that. That's really cool. Those are the next questions, right? Like I'm really excited about that kind of work because we're going to get some information. I've said for a while that one of the things that annoys me, and I know it's necessary, but it annoys me about so much of the psychedelic research that's gone on so far is all people are doing is redoing studies that were done in the 60s because we don't trust those goddamn hippies. We don't trust the goddamn hippies. So we're redoing all that stuff with rigorous modern double blind standards. And what are we finding out most of the time? Those guys. The same thing. Right, same thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I get why we have to do it. I totally do. I understand. And I applaud researchers who are doing it. I really do. Thank God for them. But can we please get to the next question? Which is how do you combine it with other modalities? And I think what you're talking about with the Flow Genome Project and what you set up is exactly what we're at the, you know, we at the third wave are trying to do with psychedelics is we're looking at how we can popularize uh, the message to a more mainstream crowd to basically strip away the terminology that was used in the counterculture in the 60s and 70s and use new terminology to make it more palpable. You know, years ago, I've known Rick Doblin and the guys at MAPS yeah. forever. Oh, they're great. Yeah. Uh, I love MAPS. So I wrote a really, I still think it's the most cutting edge because I wrote about psychedelic therapy when it was totally underground and illegal and they were using combinatory therapies. It was a patient who was dying, a young woman who was dying, and they were blending MDMA with LSD, with marijuana, with meditating, like just combinatory therapies for end of life. But in it, I was interviewing Rick Doble, and he said, you know, my motto is tune in, turn out, go to a bake sale. <laughs> right. And that he was like, look, if we want to like if we want to make this work, that's what it's got to be. It can't be subcultural and it can't be right. We can't explore working with consciousness can't be framed. It's got to be one of the things stealing fire is about. If we want the skills we really need to survive in the 21st century, right? The reason creativity, cooperation, these things are so hard to train people up in is because we keep trying to train up skill sets and we need to be training up states of mind. That's what the research shows conclusively over and over. 100 years of data, 150 years of data at this point says if you're interested in higher cooperative states, higher creative states, you have to shift your consciousness. The skill set doesn't work. You have to, at some point, shift your consciousness and have the skills. You need them both together. So what's preventing us from doing that as a society, a nation, a globe? I'm going to use two really fancy, annoying words here. <laughs> okay. these, these are anthropological words. But anthropologists talk about two kinds of societies in the world, monophasic versus polyphasic. Monophasic means you prefer a single channel of reality. We are monophasic. Most Western cultures are monophasic, meaning waking, normal waking consciousness, unadulterated, is reality. Everything else, dreams, what happens in psychedelic states, visions, 
politics, they're not quite as real. They're not quite as trustworthy. The information isn't accurate. Polyphasic societies are societies where they prevent multiple channels of reality. So these are classic, you know, shamanic cultures where, you know, shamans interpret dreams and blah, all that stuff. That's the old version of it. And you, and by the way, we became crazy monophasic mostly during the French Enlightenment, right? When we, the scientific method got developed, you have to understand that becoming monophasic, developing the scientific method, this was phenomenal. This was the great driver of civilization. It was the ultimate gas pedal and it was awesome. It was a great, great, great intervention, but we've taken it way too far, right? We've just put, we've, the car has been redlined for way too long. We ne now need to stop and go back and say, hey, wait a minute. There are other states of consciousness that, yes, maybe we don't want to treat dreams as a valid state of consciousness. Flow states, on the other hand, if you know what you're doing in them, right, you know how to separate fact from fiction. Like I always tell people, there's the difference between flow and mania is a thin line, right? I always tell people, don't go shopping in a flow state. Everything will look good. You'll come back bankrupt, right? <laughs> yes, More I More impulsive. That. More right. impulsivity. Yeah. Yes, this is what yeah. I've experienced with microdosing. Is I'll just buy shit from Facebook yeah, ads. Exactly. I'll be like, why the fuck did I buy that? Oh, I'm microdosing. Oh, okay. That, yeah, I mean, your prefrontal cortex is downregulated. So impulse control is downregulated. Pattern recognition, which says, oh my God, this thing looks good, is upregulated. It's going crazy. So, yes, I really needed this purple velvet Victorian top coat and hat. Absolutely. For $3,000. Because it's rocket burning, man. I mean, like, really? <laughs> so impulsivity, it's tied to flow state, getting outside the pale. So my follow-up question to this is practical in nature. And you talk about this in Stealing Fire a little bit, especially towards the end. Is, you know, will these flow states, this is a fear that many in the psychedelic space have, is, you know, a backlash. You had talked about at Burning Man, how surveillance is increasing now. What do you perceive as being that relationship between... Oh, I was going to say, I'm sort of addressing this in my new book, which it'll be done next week. And it's a novel, but I'm addressing this in, in novel form. But like, I think when it comes to revolutions in consciousness, there's the fast and the slow version. Historically, every time we've tried to do it really fast, Tim Leary tried to do it really fast, right? Tune in, turn on, drop out. The rave culture of the 90s. Ecstasy is going to save the war, right? It was the same thing. They tried to do it really, really fast. It has not worked. The places that it, where it's actually really did gender change, and I'm not making an argument for this, I'm just pointing this out as a, as a historical fact, is when the mind-altering technique is couched in a framework. So when the rites of Eleusis was couched inside of this entire mystical experience that the Greeks built, and there was a whole tradition around it, or the Rastas built a very thorough tradition around pot smoking, things like they stabilized the experience inside a tradition. In other words, to put it in psychedelic terms, everything we know about psychedelics is set and setting matters. And it matters at every scale. You have to have the cultural containers, not just the room has to be good. The cultural containers has to be strong enough to stabilize and things like that. So when this has worked, it's happened very slowly. What is different now is we get to replace the religion with science. We get to say, look, this is the roadmap. We know what's going on in your brain and your body. It's no longer super crazy mysterious. And we can work with it. There are rules, there are playbooks. Look, these in Stealing Fire, we break down the five right known pitfalls of this kind of work. These are places people go wrong or the four. Right? These are places people go wrong all the time. That's what we have that information at this point. So we get to steer with science for the very first time. We used to have to steer with religion. Now we get to steer with fact. And so hopefully we won't blow ourselves up this time. Hopefully we can stabilize it. Because every other time, we said this in Stealing Fire, pretty much every other time we've tried this, it's gone horribly wrong. We're not very good at this one. And what's interesting about it this time is the 60s were millions of people. Now it's tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people who are playing with these things, who are experimenting with these things. And it's high times on Main Street, as we point out, my mom, my suburban Cleveland, Ohio mom is a Reiki master and has a meditation practice and does yoga. And, you know, she's 70 some years old. And this is what Main Street looks like now. So, like, I'll, we're conducting this experiment at a huge level. And the consequences of getting it wrong now could actually be society wide, which is interesting. We've never been in that position before. And global society wide, I think this is a point that you make 
in uh, your book, and this is Daniel Pinchbeck just wrote a book about this called How Soon Is Now, with the fact that we're dealing with an ecological crisis. I don't think it's any coincidence that this is occurring at this point in time because we seem to be needing or seeking out this sense of connectedness and togetherness, this sense of moving forward as a community rather than as individuals. And it seems like if we fail now, and if we can't reintegrate consciousness and flow states, or, you know, you talk about selflessness and timelessness, you know, these aspects of understanding and and transcending the ego, then we also might not have, some people would go so far as to say, might not have a home to live on uh, very much longer. And I might be one of those people who might go that far. I mean, one of the reasons I started Equilibrium, right, the the event we talked about, is because to to work on biodiversity is biodiversity, for example, is one of those secret hidden issues that very few people think about. And the reason is because plants and animals, not really humans, most people can't get past the human boundary, right? You really need to kind of dissolve and expand outward to really start to see nature. And there's 50 years of eco-psychology that talks about this, like, one of the reasons I have a conference to bridge the gap between technologists and environmentalists is eco-psychology, which is literally just the study of how do we psychologically interact with the environment, tells us that if you live in cities and you stare at screens at a perceptual level, you're not going to take in the natural world. You're literally not taking in the data. You're not seeing the natural world. As a result, how the hell do you take care of something you can't even see? It's not even part of your reality. It's not there. That's just, you have to remember that the bandwidth of consciousness, right, is, and this is, is about 2,000 data bits. That's how much information you can take in per second. The majority of those data bits are dominated by dangers in the environment, right? 60, 70% of all that information comes in. It's just, did something move? Is something threatening me, right? So you've got a little slice of data to work with. And if you're staring at screens and you're living in cities and you're not seeing nature, your brain goes, look, man, I can only give you so much critical information. I'm going to filter out this stuff that you don't pay any attention to. You know, have you focus on the screen kind of thing instead of the trees outside. This has ecological consequences, one of which is we don't pay attention to plants and animals, which is why we're in the middle of the sixth grade extinction, right? The fifth grade extinction killed off the dinosaurs. Flow states, psychedelic states, meditative states, it expands the information we have access to, right? We take in more information. That's why you tend to connect to nature in these states. You're actually seeing the natural world for the first time for a lot of us, right? Because you're suddenly taking in that information you weren't normally taking in. The point about biodiversity is, you know, this was recent research done at Stanford. If we don't reverse the slide, right? And we don't, the web of life isn't a metaphor. It's literal. And we're, by killing off plants and animals, we're breaking the web of life. Paul Ehrlich just did research that says he thinks we've got three generations until we pass the point of no return. And when the point of no return means is we just pass the carrying capacity of the planet. So it can no longer hold seven billion people. And as a general rule, when, you know, the planet tends to find a way to take care of those disasters, whether it's plague or ecological crisis or whatever, it, it's going to reset. It just doesn't really care much about us as a species. Look at how big the dinosaurs were, and they're just completely gone. It's not like this happens, right? This is just the way life works. And if we're not careful, if we don't access these states and start understand, seeing more of the world around us, I think it's critical. And I think I started the flow work very early on. Jamie and I, this was always part of our mission. Is like at the Flow Genome Project, our interest is training up the best of the best so they can go out and help us save the world. Sounds ridiculous, but like... I think, you know, when Peter Diamandis and myself wrote Abundance, I really thought it was this happy, positive, incredible, we can use technology to solve our grand challenges book, which it is. But it was Abundance or Bust. We either do this or we're going to have maybe insurmountable challenges. So uh, to me, if we're going to actually solve this, this it's going to require the greatest cooperative effort in history. And that doesn't just mean everybody working together. It means everybody performing at their very best working together. So... One of the reasons I got involved in flow research and human performance research was that was the goal there, because I think it's critical at this point. And it is critical, and I think it's even a follow-up question to that is, what makes you optimistic? Because I think optimism is really critical, and I, I have a lot of optimism, and that's largely why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. But I know a lot of people who are very pessimistic, who are very kind of, uh, we can't do this, it's too late. What makes you optimistic that this is possible and that we can achieve this, that we can kind of come together as a community and overcome this massive 
ecological crisis? I don't know. I, I mean, I have answers for you. So some of it, and this is an abundance, like we are neurobiologically wired to be pessimists on a lot of levels. We're personal optimists, but we're global pessimists, right? And this is fundamental neurological hardwiring made a lot worse by the news cycle and by a billion media channels. So let me just break it down really simply. As I said, we take in, so consciousness, we talked about a second ago, it's 2000 outputs. You know how many inputs come in? Tourney Anderson in, in a great book called The User Illusion, which is the best book on consciousness ever, ever written. And everybody should read it if you're interested in this stuff. There've been a lot of different estimates on how much data do we take in per second. The oldest estimate that most people trust is Marvin Zimmerman's, and he just counted up inputs of senses, and he came up to 11 million. Jordan Anderson redid this in the user illusion, the number jumped to 400 billion. Everybody agrees that 2000 is consciousness, right? That's pretty much well established. So the reduction is enormous. So how does this happen? Well, the information comes in and the brain passes it through filters. The first filter it stops at is the amygdala. This is our danger detector. So one of the reasons when positive psychologists talk about, hey, we're tilted to see more negative than positive, this is why. It's because neurobiologically, you're taking in 400 billion inputs a second, and the first filter all that stuff is encountering is your danger detector. So the first thing that's happening is anything that is new in the environment and could be threatening or is moving and could attack you, that it gets priority. Any threat anywhere gets priority. Here's the problem. There's a lot of problems with that, but the amygdala was designed in an era of immediacy, right? The threats are the tiger and the bush. So the amygdala is designed for immediate threats. Most of the threats we face in the modern world are probabilistic. The economy might nosedive, terrorists might attack, my girlfriend might break up with me, right? That sort of thing. The amygdala isn't designed to handle probabilistic dangers. It cannot shut off until the danger is gone completely. Probabilistic dangers are never gone completely. This is why in the modern world, on a general aid, this is we live in a low-grade state of crisis all the time. This is one of the main reasons why. It is made worse by a million media channels. The media understands this, right? The old newspaper saw if it bleeds, it leads. The reason that exists is because of the amygdala, right? All they're saying is, look, man, we can con you into watching this news program by leading with really horrific negative news because you're entirely neurobiologically hardwired to pay a ton of attention to this stuff. And for every negative bit of information that you take in, take six or seven positive bits to twist it around, to get yourself looking at anything other than the fearful data that's coming in. So in the modern world, if you don't filter out your news cautiously, and if you don't, if you're not aware of this stuff, you're going to think we're in a perpetual crisis all the time. So the world appears a lot worse than it actually is. So one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because I understand the neurobiology, right? I have enough cognitive literacy to understand what's going on in my brain and my body, and then I'm hardwired to look at things in a certain way. So that's first of all. The other thing is I've spent my career kind of on the cutting edge of both environmental challenges and technological challenges. And I always say, like, I have a friend named Peter Diamandis, who I met 25 years ago when he had this little idea called the X Prize. His goal was, I'm going to try to open the space frontier. And he started the X Prize because he wanted to have a contest to try to open it. And he built the International Space University so he could train the next generation of space researchers. Then he started the Zero Gravity Corporation so he could take people on weightless flights, give them a taste of what that would feel like. And then for super billionaires, he started that company where he flew people out to the space space station who had $20 million for the ticket. And then he started an asteroid mining company because that's material. He surrounded the problem. But here's the thing. The private space industry, when Peter started this, I wrote the very first article about the X Prize in any major publication, right? And so I've known Peter forever. Everybody, I knew everybody I interviewed, NASA, every aerospace corporation I could talk to, they all thought he was out of his mind. It'll never happen. No private citizen can open this. Are you crazy? It's a total impossible. Forget about it. Never. Well, the private space industry is now a multiple billion dollar industry. Because, you know, my friend ran a contest and a bunch of like-minded people jumped in. Like, why do I think this stuff is doable? Because, you know, I watched my friend Peter, who's no different than anybody else you know, puts his pants in the same way, do the impossible. I, you know, in Rise of Superman, you know, I always say that the action adventure sport athletes I wrote about 
one of the things you have to understand is they reinvented kinesthetic possibility, what is possible for our species, right? These are people, when I, in the early 90s, the group that I was writing about, who I met, these are a rowdy, irreverent, punk rock bunch of people with not a lot of natural advantages. Most of them didn't have a lot of education. Most of them didn't have a lot of money. A ton of them came from broken homes and horrific childhoods. And yet they reinvented what was physically possible for our species. So why do I think this stuff is solvable? Because over and over and over, I mean, that's what I've done in my life, right? I've studied how do people do the impossible? That's my fundamental question. What does it take to do the impossible? And I've looked at it in every domain you could possibly look at it and written eight books about, about it. From every angle you could possibly explore this question. I've seen it over and over and over again. So both cognitive literacy, I understand how the brain is hardwired. And I've had firsthand experience with what the impossible looks like. As it, you know, when I was a journalist, my job was to cover those moments science fiction became science fact. So the first time, for example, an artificial vision implant was turned on, I was in the room. In fact, I was what was seen, but that's a totally different story and that was accidental. But like literally, like up until that moment in time, curing blindness was a biblical miracle. Mm -hmm. Jesus cured blindness. And then, you know, in 2000, it was a Wired magazine cover story. A guy, literally like a maverick inventor working kind of almost by himself in a sort of a legal shop in a garage in upstate New York, builds a brain implant, puts it in. You know, I meet a blind guy. He's been blind for 20 years. They turn this thing on. Two days later, he's driving a car around a parking lot. So over and over and over in my life, I've seen impossible happen firsthand. I want to hop in here because I think I, you know, I just want to weave a couple of patterns that we've been talking about in our conversation. Kind of what you're talking about is, you know, I feel like there are more people, you know, Joseph Campbell would call it like a hero's journey in a way. There are more people who are stepping up into the sense of, of power and excitement, you know, building these big dreams, having these big dreams like your friend Peter, and then doing whatever it takes to get there because of the passion and the interest and, and the excitement they have, the love for it. And I think, again, that kind of comes back into like information and data processing is, is where does this come from? And I think it largely comes out of necessity. In many cases, people like you and me and Peter, they see a problem and they, for some reason, they want to they solve it or they want to fix it or they, they want to build a more efficient or a better system, whatever that might be. And that, I think that's, for me, why I'm optimistic is because I think more and more people are recognizing that and they're getting this kind of this sense of discomfort and discontent and they want to kind of step out of the norm and start to build their own thing. And we're seeing this now with the democratization of all this technology where it's cheaper than it ever has been in the past to start your own business or build your own idea or kind of branch out and do whatever because we've built efficient enough systems where we, we're starting to free people from the confines of this really kind of industrialized monoculture that we've built over the last like three, four hundred years. And then when you put in flow states into that, it just helps to accelerate the process as long as the infrastructure is there before people really kind of go for ultimate human performance. You see a lot of things there. <laughs> Did I? And, yeah. I mean, so, you know, the one thing I want to say, because I hear this a lot when I talk to millennials, and I just want to like think about this for a second. So you talk about the capitalistic monoculture, blah, 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 yeah. all those restraints, all those limits, right? And you're not wrong. Of course, you're not wrong, right? I know what you're talking about. And you're not wrong, except you're really wrong. And let me tell you why I think you're also really wrong, which is, it's the same problem you have with altered states. So a lot of people, they start getting into flow, they start getting into psychedelics, they get start, they want to feel that all the time. Right. They want to be in flow. the question I get more than anything else is how do I live in flow? And one, it's not neurobiologically possible. We can talk about that if you care. But the more important thing is you wouldn't want to. The information is in the contrast. If you can't compare what you feel like in flow when you're having that sensation of oneness with everything, if all you feel is oneness with everything all the time, right, then individual consciousness is going to be the thing we're questing after. Right. It's the opposition of the ball. That's why in the end of Stealing Fire, we say you can't escape the human condition. It's the push and pull between the both. And why I jumped in front of the capital, what you said about capitalism is, look, I exist because I had that system to push against. The limits of it gave me a lot of energy, a lot of fight, right? A. So, you know, that rebellion was very, very useful for me. The other thing is tucked inside of that is 
competition. And it's really easy to look at competition and say, oh, that's, that's an awful motivator. It's not, and, and on a lot of levels, it can lead to a lot of problems, right? It can lead, for example, straight into the last financial crisis and a bunch of guys on Wall Street stealing a shit ton of money. Like it can produce that, but it also is the fire that drove me in a sense, right? Like I'm a competitive as hell. I wanna be the best writer in the history of the universe. Now I get, by the way, there is no such thing as the best writer in the history of the universe. It's a made up title. And I like, I could care less about beating you or the other guy or whatever. I'm competing against myself, but like, that drives me. I always say that the people I've seen who have kind of taken on the impossible, they are running away from something just as fast as they're running towards something, right? That double motivation is really useful. And I think, because it's just too hard to run towards something. It's too difficult to get to the impossible if you have one motivation. You need a lot of different lines of passion intersecting. I always say that passion, curiosity, when you get multiple lines of curiosity intersecting, you get passion. When you add passion into different way, intersection of a bunch of passions, now you're starting to get purpose. You need as much help as you can because the motivation is hard. Because it's easy to sit on the couch and watch West Wing reruns. I mean, they're pretty funny. It's a great show. It's an Nobody excellent outrides show. Aaron Sorkin. Nobody outrides Aaron Sorkin. That's just what it is. You're right. And I think... I'm 26. So when I see these ideas and I perceive these things that are going on, I get excited. I get excited about the changes that are occurring. I get excited about the chaos that we're going through. I get excited about there are so many different things. And I think like on an individual personal level, I have been, for example, microdosing on the past couple of years. And this is something we often talk about on the podcast. And what I've started to notice is I've been more or less microdosing the last two years. I've had a few months off here and there. By and large, it's like once or twice a week. And all the things that you're now talking about in this conversation, the sense of you see, you know, you pattern recognition, impulsivity. I'm starting to notice that I was going really in this direction, whatever that direction was, in a very strong way. And so I'm stepping back and getting more context and slowing down and not trying to basically talk about a whole massive idea in the confines of 30 seconds is probably a good idea. So thank you for calling me out on that, I guess, and making the point that we exist in intention and that you have this passage in Stealing Fire, which basically talks about how, I forget the exact wording, but it's, you can't always be in flow states. You have to sometimes go back into these states of being that are monk-like in a way to be able to really contextualize the experiences you're having for a better life or a better world or whatever the, that might be. And I think ultimately that, that seems to be what we're both after, what, what your work has done, what, what we're trying to do, what the communities that we've cultivated and developed, whether that's around flow and psychedelics, is it's by and large, how are we utilizing these states of flow to make our realities? And, you know, like you said, in these monophasic realities, that's one reality, but how are we making that better for ourselves and our community through altruism and another thing. I think it's all about, I mean, like all this stuff to me is about the fact that we're just, there's two ways when you're faced at a, from a biological level, when you're faced with scarcity, fundamental law of evolution, right? Is competition. We're faced with scarcity. What do we do? Well, there's two possibilities. You can compete over scarce resources. That's one. And up till very recently, that was really the only possibility. The other one is you can make new resources. That's what technology allows us to do. That's what we've gotten. So the abundance has become an option. So the other answer to kind of the riddle of survival is innovation. And I think that's what all these states are, a fundamental, we're hardwired for this, right? This is why Ronald K. Siegel at UCLA discovered that pretty much every mammal on earth has found a way to alter its consciousness, right? We're wired for this, this is how we think creatively. This is how we innovate our way out of out of problems. I think they're both viable, right? Competition doesn't go away, but there's a there's a way to do this cooperatively. If we want to, and living in abundance, I think is a great way to do that. So let's wrap up there. It, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. But before we leave, could you just tell our listeners where they can find you? You know, maybe the URL, your Twitter, or whatever it might be. The best way to reach out. Yeah, StephenCotler.com my website, S-T-E-V-E-N-K-O-T-L-A-R. That's where you'll find me. If you're interested in digging deeper into flow, 
flowgenomeproject.com, right? That has the free flow profile. So uh, come if you want more flow in your life, that's the best place to start, easy place to start. And uh, I'm Stephen underscore Kotler on Twitter, which is actually the best way to probably have a conversation with me. Great. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for joining us to talk about all things related to your personal experiences into flow states, into the state of the world that we're currently in. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, to get a chance to get to know you and chat with you. Thanks for listening to the Psychedelia Podcast with Paul Austin. Want more psychedelic information? Go to our website at thethirdwave.co and register for our email list and newsletter. Also, please consider donating to The Third Wave via our Patreon page. Donations make this podcast possible. Psychedelics have the potential to transform lives. By donating, you enable us to continue to inform people about the benefits of these powerful substances.